I Hate Politics is a podcast dedicated to exploring a human activity we love to hate. We look at human life, culture, economics closest to us in our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools and streets, and in our local governments. Together, we'll explore how politics is central to getting things done in societies where we treasure diverse views and preferences. I'm Sunil Dasgupta. I've spent my life studying politics, and I know this. Unless we want to live in a dictatorship or a monarchy, we are stuck with politics. Politics is more than just Trump, Biden, or elections. It's how we fix potholes, make our streets safer, where we put our schools, and decide who goes to them. It's about coming together as a community. It's about us. Let's go find those stories. Budgets and redistricting are two pillars of our political system, often arcane and eye-glazing. But right now, Maryland counties are wrestling with budgets and gearing up to wrestle with redistricting once the full census data becomes available. In this episode, I talk to my UMBC colleague and master budget expert, Roy Myers, about how surprisingly robust tax revenues and federal government largest turned the politics of scarcity into the politics of plenty. And I talked to Montgomery Blair High School statistics teacher, David Stein, who is a member of the County Commission on Electoral Redistricting. The commission's work is largely on hold, waiting for census data, but David Stein has been teaching redistricting in his statistics class for over a decade. What can we learn from David's classroom redistricting? How county electoral districts change will determine the fate of many aspirants to local office. Also in this episode, we use music from Montgomery County native and now DC-based singer-songwriter Emily Hall. Emily is also an international educator who trains teachers in integrating music in the classroom. You can find her work on Spotify. If you want to showcase your music on the podcast or know someone else who might, please email ihppod at gmail.com. Now, the news roundup. The Commonwealth of Virginia announced scholarships for descendants of slaves at some state universities. Among the first, several jurisdictions in Northern Virginia are freezing or lowering residential property taxes in an effort to pull out of the pandemic. If what Roy Meyer says about Maryland's budgets is true of Virginia's as well, that's one way to spend the unexpected tax collections and federal transfers. Montgomery County is putting up half a million dollars to seed a global pandemic prevention and biodefense center that is the brainchild of the Washington, D.C. area nonprofit Connected DMV, a joint venture between businesses and local government agencies to support regional governance and economic integration. The University of Shady Groves just launched its new $185 million biotech building that m- just might be the perfect location for the new center. Green building tax credit in Montgomery County has gone through an overhaul even during the pandemic. The old LEED certification tax credit is being phased out in favor of a new tax credit that is based on energy reduction, bringing focus to the core of the climate crisis, fossil fuel use. Rockville is looking at redesigning its metro station. The Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA, which runs Metro, is funding a study to see what needs to be done. The station was built in 1984 and and is considered to be aging and in need of repair. And the city of Rockville wants to connect the eastern metro side of Rockville Pike with the town center on the western side of the pike. This will allow the city to see the redevelopment of eastern Rockville all the way to Lincoln Park, which has been neglected in city investments for decades. Public input is welcome. You can find project details on the City of Rockville website, rockvillemd.gov, and click on City Projects 
to find the station project information. Montgomery Parks is proposing to build a dog park at Norwood Park in Bethesda, Chevy Chase. Some don't want the dog park, and at a public hearing pressed complaints, including the fact that the dog park will be next to a children's playground. Kids and dogs playing near each other. Isn't that the whole point? In Tacoma Park, where homes now sell for around a million dollars, the fight over redeveloping Tacoma Junction, the site of a beloved local co-op grocery, continues. The co-op has filed a suit to force the development company to ensure access to a parking lot its patrons use, and supporters of the co-op are picketing and protesting. Don't forget, May 13th, between 6 and 8 p.m., the Maryland State Highway Administration is holding a virtual public session on its plan to pilot a bike lane on University Boulevard starting June 2021. You can find the meeting link on openstreetsmontgomery.com. Montgomery County has allowed summer baseball, yes, Bethesda Train, and okayed youth swim leagues. We are very excited to be pool bound this summer. I'll be back with Roy Myers. Roy Myers, welcome to I Hate Politics. Uh, good to talk to you, Sunil. So I have heard you say that the that the state of Maryland went from uh, having shortfalls at the beginning of the current legislative 2021 legislative session to the end when we are, if not in surplus, but at least close to it. What happened? You know, I think the best way to answer this is to go back to the Great Recession, actually. Prior to the Great Recession, we had this structural deficit, which was the joint result of cutting income taxes a bit, but then increasing education spending through the Thornton formula, and then also the normal growth of Medicaid. And so it wasn't until the special session of 2007 that the legislature, under the call of Governor O'Malley, eliminated that structural deficit, particularly by raising the sales tax rate. And then it's always something, the Great Recession hits. And that recession was huge. Uh, We lost about a seventh of our general fund revenues in just one year. And so you have, at the time, the general fund revenues were down by about $2 billion out of 14. And that's, that's a big, big hit. And so eventually the state dealt with that by making a lot of tough choices. So when this pandemic hit in March, it looked like it was gonna be just as bad as that, in fact, even worse because in March and April of 2020, the state's employment rate declined by 14% in just two months. That's like you know, going back to the Great Depression and shortening the, the unemployment drop by a, a large amount. And so the revenue estimates that, that Andy Schaufel and the other experts put out were really doomsday quality. And it led the, you know, the pandemic also led the General Assembly to adjourn early. And then in May, and also on July 1st, the Board of Public Works cut spending two times, not by that much actually compared to the Great Recession cuts, but we expected things to really be very, very difficult. And then what happened in the about the same time was that the federal government did the unexpected, which was that it passed the CARES Act as well as two other quite smaller relief acts. And it's the, the rare case where the federal government stepped in to a major economic catastrophe with the right amount of money, that is it went big and it did it quickly instead of waiting too long. And so what that did is it made it very less likely that the economy would tailspin even more. But we also learned that our economy is actually quite robust to this kind of pandemic, at least for white collar workers who had the ability to work from home. Not that that's been perfect, as you well know. For example, if you have kids, it's not an easy thing to do. But on the other hand, uh, what we also learned is that this turned out to be a so-called K-shaped recession the people who really suffer from this are people who are doing direct service jobs. Often they're not paid very well, but that doesn't create that much of a problem for the state on the revenue side because we weren't relying on them too much for income tax revenues. So in September and December of 2020, 
the revenue projections turned out to be a lot better than we ever thought they would be way back in March and April. Because first of all, we had a lot of people still working who had high salaries. The stock market was booming, believe it or not. That's kind of still hard to understand in many respect. And sales tax revenues were much better than we thought they would be. In part, that's the result of a Supreme Court decision a couple of years ago called the Wayfair decision, which made it a lot easier for states to tax online sales. But when people moved from brick and mortar buying to online, we actually didn't lose as much money as we thought we would have. Now, a lot of that online sales, so those revenues are dedicated to financing the Blueprint Fund, the Kerman Commission education reforms. Right. But since we had so much money pouring in from that, it allowed the general revenue financing for education to be somewhat lower than it otherwise would be. And that's not to say that we didn't have problems. Uh, you know, there were real problems with unemployment insurance. There are so many people unemployed and we had this antiquated system in the state, both in terms of personnel, but mostly in terms of technology, information technology okay. of dealing with this crush. So we had to spend more money on that. We certainly had to spend more money on health uh, you yeah. know, hiring nurses and buying PPE and so on. And there were also problems, as you well know, at the university level, because we lost some students and tuition, sure. I think we fee revenue. And the transportation trust fund lost a lot of money from, you know, not, nobody paying in the fare box going on right. the marked trains or on, on the buses. So, you know, we still did have some problems, but it was far less worse than we thought. Then in December, the Congress and the president finally, again, months late compared to the norm, what we hope would be their normal way of acting, they passed the consolidated or the omnibus appropriations bill and tagging onto it was a relief and response bill that threw another trillion dollars or so at the problem. And then uh, probably even more importantly in March under President Biden's leadership and with that thin democratic majority in the Senate and the reconciliation process in the Senate, past the American recovery plan. And that is another $2 trillion, a substantial amount of that, 6.8 billion came to the state and counties. So we actually ended up last year and this year in a much better shape than we thought we ever would be. So how much better are we? I mean, in terms of, do we still have a shortfall or um, have we wiped it out? It's wiped out. We, have, we, don't, we do not have a deficit this year or next year. The so-called structural deficit is what we assume to be the um, excess of expenditures over revenues and particularly in, into the out years when the economy is okay. And for a couple of years, that's gone. In fact, our rainy day fund, which we thought we would have to draw down significantly, and we did for a while to cover some of these cash needs during the, the pandemic, is now in at least as good shape as it was right before the recession. Plus there's an additional amount of money in the general fund that's uncommitted. Are you following counties as well and they are in a similar position? Uh, it's a lot harder to follow all of them. <laughs> and uh, I know you're in Montgomery County. I don't follow Montgomery County as closely as I do my own county, Howard County or Baltimore County. Sure. But there's a, there's a lot of money coming out of the federal government to the counties that actually hasn't been spent yet. Let me give you a, a, fig, a couple of figures. Hmm. Um, if you add up all the five big bills that the federal government passed starting back in March and then uh, March, 2020, and then including the March 21 bill, that's $5.9 trillion of spending. That's a lot of money. And there's an additional half trillion dollars of spending uh, increased through just pure administrative actions. Out of that, 878 billion went to state and local governments across the country, and only 393 billion of it has been dispersed yet. So in other words, less than half the money that is in the pipeline has been dispersed. The money, and particularly in the, uh, the March 21 bill, is incredibly flexible it, it, compared particularly to the CARES Money Act. The CARES Money Act had a lot of strings on it and it was pretty difficult in some cases, particularly for counties to spend it. Mm -hmm. uh, the money that just came, that just was authorized in March can be used for many different purposes. 
and actually doesn't have to be spent for two whole years. So it's hmm. not what we call use it or lose it money where you have to spend it within one year. It's two years, so it could be spent uh, you know, 18 months from now. So this is giving, uh, it should be giving county executives a pretty, and county councils a pretty good feeling about, about uh, where, they're, where they're gonna be. Okay, so how did this windfall change political calculations at the state or in, in, in the counties? You know, it's clearly the case that there's gonna be differences of opinion between the governor and the legislature. You have sure. a Republican, moderate Republican governor and a supermajority Democratic legislature. Delegate uh, Carol Resnick wrote, wrote, I think, quite an interesting um, op-ed for Maryland Matters a month or so ago where he compared the governor to a, and you'll enjoy this as a fellow professor, he compared the governor, governor to a student who did the least on a group paper, but then takes the credit for the A, <laughs> which, which I think is somewhat unfair and that the governor is in a difficult position, not only in dealing with the Democratic supermajority, but there are clearly splits within the Republican minority about which way the, the, the party should go. Um, but I think it's also the case that there's a tradition in this state of reaching compromises. And that happened twice in this session. First of all, when the governor proposed his budget, he proposed a bill called the relief bill. Right. And the legislature made a lot of modifications to that. But there was a good faith negotiation about what should go into it, and it was pretty significant. It increased the state earned income tax credit, and later there was a bill related to it that increased similar benefits for people who are undocumented and therefore have individual tax numbers. Small business aid, the unemployment benefits that people got no longer were subject to taxation. The employers don't have to pay high unemployment insurance taxes as they otherwise would be. So, and that was a a bipartisan deal. And then just the budget itself passed for next year. That was a major negotiation where the Democrats got a lot and the, and the, the governor got a lot. You know, the context of it was pretty fascinating in that the Democrats were pretty irritated at, at how the governor was spending some of the federal money before. You know, there was that famous case of the plane landing from Korea with the, <laughs> yes. the the Korean metal su supplies that turned out to be useless. Yeah. And, but it more generally, the, the governor is supposed to file what are called budget amendments mm -hmm. when he spends federal money and let the legislature know how he's doing it. And a lot of those budget amendments were late in coming if they ever came at all. And so there was a lot of anger in the General Assembly about that. In fact, there was a bill passed sponsored by Senator Penske that now requires in a future emergency, the governor to give 72 hours notice of any contracts along those lines. What's most important is that Delegate McIntosh, who is the very smart and powerful uh, head of the House Appropriations Committee, had this bill that said, if, if there are any unanticipated federal funds uh, coming in, if, if the legislature passed this bill, it would set up this very demanding process that the governor would have to face in spending the money. And in fact, that matter deciding how the money could be spent. And so when she laid that marker down, uh, her counterpart, if you will, uh, Department of Budget Management Secretary David Brinkley, who is a very experienced state legislator, who was a state senator beforehand, Frederick Carroll County, and he's a real pro. The two of them got together, or more generally, the, the Department of Legislative Services, the Democratic legislative leaders, and the Republican staff of Governor Hogan negotiated a lot over that budget bill. That was made easier by the fact that they had so much money coming in. Can you speak specifically to uh, some of the changes that happened as a consequence of these negotiations? The state decided to spend some money, more money on broadband, realizing that there's a digital divide. And that was particularly worrisome this year with the learning loss for kids and homes that don't have good computers or good digital access. Uh, there's some money from job training. There's money for rental assistance. There's money for childcare. There's money for transit. In fact, if you look at almost any county executive's webpage these days, and this is about the time in April when budgets have just been presented to the county councils, the chief executives, county executives, or the, uh, the managers of the counties are saying, we're adding to these programs rather than cutting from them. And often without really saying, we are using federal funds to make these additions. And, and so what I think the question some of your listeners might keep in mind, what's gonna happen two years from now 
to the extent that we're used to some of these programs, if they are built into the base, or how are we going to finance them later? I mean, many of them, I think, are great ideas. Uh, although in the case, for example, of the Maryland funded broadband, President Biden has a pretty big proposal in his infrastructure bill to finance broadband expansion as well. So in that case, it might make sense for the state to hold off for a little, little and use the federal funds to swap in from what swap into uh, the budget so the state doesn't have to spend its own money to to accelerate broadband distribution. I believe Maryland is putting in three hundred million dollars for um, statewide broadband. That sounds about right. And you're saying that if you wait a little bit, um, the infrastructure bill might cover some of this. It is very common for the state and to some extent the counties as well. When federal funds become available to use what's called a fund swap, to use that federal money to displace what the state or the county would have to use of its own revenues to provide Mm -hmm. a service. And then that money that isn't being used anymore for that service can be used for something else. And so that's those fund swaps were a major contributor to the improvement of the state's fiscal position and uh, refinancing the uh, rainy day fund, for example. In Montgomery County, County Executive Mark Eldridge gave the schools uh, about $40 million above the maintenance of effort law uh, requirement and thereby reset the base. Right. And one of your concerns is what's going to happen after two years. What is your best hope? What is your worst case scenario? Well, let's start with just that particular issue of going over maintenance of effort. And so you're right, that ratchets up the base. And that means that to reduce the budget in education in a future year becomes very, very difficult, in part because that's just a requirement of the Constitution. To me, the even greater problem is that by having Uh, mandated spending in the budget, not just for education, but for other areas, it means that when bad times come, a lot of the cuts are targeted on the remaining small percentage of spending that we view as more discretionary. And so that, for example, might include spending for, say, behavioral health services. Well, what happens during a recession? There are more people that need behavioral health assistance. And now some of it might be delivered through the school system as is imagined under the blueprint through wraparound services. That's gonna miss some people like adults in many cases. And I'm not sure that's the most effective way of allocating resources. So in general, uh, as as a budget person, I'm much more interested in having a lot of year to year flexibility in the budget and allowing the legislature and the governor and his staff to respond to to changes in conditions. And for that matter, new information about how well programs are working or not to make flexible allocations. But the politics of budgeting in this state is quite contrary to that, or at least it has been, because going back to before the passage of question one in the most recent election, the legislature couldn't add to, to programs above what the governor requested. Sure. So that gave a tremendous incentive for politicians to, for legislators to try and mandate spending to make sure more money would be spent on the programs they like and to assure their supporters of those programs that they'd be okay. Now that question one is passed, starting in the 24 budget, that is in county year 23, the legislature will be able to add to programs as long as it's willing to cut from other ones to not exceed the governor's total requested budget. What I find particularly interesting about that, though, is this year there still were bills that were passed that mandated spending in years when the legislature will be able to add money. Do you really think the legislature will stop adding specific mandated spending? Politically, that's what they do. That's that's true. But I think it's second best. To me, the best approach would be to spend much more time trying to understand what the actual outcomes are from from state spending what the impacts are of what government services provide. And if we, if we were to have better information about that, then it would be easier for us to have in more intelligent discussions about where our limited resources can go. And we have this system in the state called Managing for Results. And those data are, aren't even published with the budget anymore. They have a number of flaws associated with them. Now, some of those data are used. The analysts for the Department of Legislative Services do use some of them for giving advice in the legislature. 
but we're pretty far behind the federal government agencies in, in many cases and behind a number of other states in using this approach. And for that matter, we're behind Montgomery County and Baltimore City, uh, locations that have put much more time into trying to follow this kind of results-oriented budgeting. So I think the state needs to do more of that. It'd be a better approach than simply mandating this and mandating that. Have you found the Democratic Government Operations Committee more uh, receptive to the kinds of things you're talking about? I think it's a it's a slow slog on that regard. I mean, there there have been some bills passed uh, this year that I think were slight progress along those lines. So, for example. Uh, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, Delegate Ann Kaiser, is from Montgomery County as well. He's from sure. Montgomery County. Right. Uh, a bill of hers passed that, that is going to set up a regular process for evaluating the tax credits that we have, tax mm. preferences for business to promote economic development. Uh, and some of that money is wasted. You know, for example, uh, to, to hit close to home, the money that the state has given to Marriott Corporation for years to stay in the state. Right when the threat that Marriott issued to leave the state and the county was obviously a bluff. They were not going to follow through with it. That's a waste of money. And so there are other things that we do. Uh, how do you know it's what is a bluff? I mean, uh, how do we know that really? Oh, actually, actually, uh, this is something that you'll enjoy as a former, as a <laughs> fellow UMBC professor. I had a student named Andrea Thompson, who uh -huh. wrote her senior thesis about economic development subsidies after having interned at DBED uh -huh. Department of Business Economic Development, the predecessor to the now named Department of Commerce. And one right. of the things she wrote about was, was Marriott. Uh -huh. and Marriott, in a previous uh, incarnation of its threat to leave, was in negotiations with both Maryland and Virginia. It had decided to stay in Maryland, but Maryland hadn't passed the legislation yet. Mm -hmm. and, but it, asked, it told Virginia, saying, we're going to stay in Maryland but please don't tell anybody because we want to make sure this Maryland bill passes. Here's another, another one other piece of evidence. We're giving opportunity zone money uh -huh. to the Port Covington belt. It's not an opportunity zone. It's an opportunity zone only because of a mapping error. There's a great article in um, ProPublica about this. There was an interesting uh, local tax relief bill that will allow counties to move away from a flat rate for the pig, county piggyback tax on the income. And so originally it was written to allow counties to go to 3.5 for the highest bracket, but then could go to a lower percentage, but not below 2.5. And the 3.5, this was supported by MAKO, in fact, written by MAKO by a former student of ours. The 3.5 was, was killed, but now the counties can go ahead and have a progressive rate structure on the income tax for the piggyback county tax. I think it's going to particularly benefit Anne Arundel because Anne Arundel is not a 3.2 3.2 yet, so they can have a revenue neutral, raise rates on higher income and cut rates for lower lower income. Looking forward now, the federal government is clearly a big variable, but what do you think we should be looking at at the state level? The reality is that we're entering election season, right? And we're going to have a all hands involved Democratic primary, most likely. It seems like they're going to be many many candidates. Sure. And, um, you know, probably, you know, could be the Secretary Schultz uh, will just clean out the Republican field already. I think she's a pretty good candidate, although it's going to be difficult for a Republican to win the election. So how the different Democratic candidates position themselves on issues that, that are current now and that will come up that we don't know about yet, I think that's really going to dominate the next year and uh, the next legislative session as well. Roy Myers, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it, and I hope you'll come back. My pleasure. And it's, uh, it's nice to talk to somebody who has the range to go all the way from international relations to local politics. You are, are a rare bird, Sunil. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Thank you. I am home and all is well. I am free. I am home and all is well. I am free. I am home and all is well. And I am free, I am home, and all is well. I am free, I am home, and all is well. I am free, I am home, and all That's Montgomery and D.C. singer-songwriter Emily Hall. 
My next guest is David Stein, who teaches math and statistics at Montgomery Blair High School. David was also selected to be a member on the Commission on Redistricting that the County Council convened to recommend redistricting of electoral constituencies in the county. The county charter requires that districts be redrawn based on the census every 10 years, and these districts have equal number of residents. Further, last November, county residents approved a ballot measure to add two more county council seats. Together, the population change and the two new seats could potentially remake the county council. Now, keep in mind, the commission recommends changes. The county council can draw its own final map, and it would be unrealistic to expect members to draw themselves out of their own seat. Redistricting is another one of those arcane political topics that few understand. But for over a decade, David Stein has been teaching, or to use his words, modeling the problem of redistricting as it applies to the Congress. With the work of the Redistricting Commission basically on hold until the final census data is released, possibly in September 2021, I asked David about his classroom experience and how his students might help. David Stein, welcome to I Hate Politics. Thank you, Sunil, for having me on I Hate Politics. Although I don't hate politics, just for the record. <laughs> yes. All right. What do the council districts look like now? And what are some problems associated with it? So right now, uh, we have five districts, uh, five uh, single member districts on the county council. Mm -hmm. And then we have four at large seats. Can you clarify what single member means? Oh, sure. So it's a single district. For instance, I live in Tacoma Park, which is in district five. And so we are represented by, well, Tom Hucker is the current uh, district five council member. And so we have five of those council members, uh, each representing a district. And then we have four at-large council members who are elected by the county at large, not by their own particular district. We can look at the way the districts are. And for instance, we could look at you know racial demographics, for instance, and you could see that of the five districts, three of them are uh, majority minority districts, district mm -hmm. five, where I live, district two and district four. Um, although uh, two is very close to 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other two are not majority, um, majority minority districts. Uh, and you could break it down by any number of uh, statistics. You can look at the income levels uh, where district one, uh, which is Bethesda and, and Potomac area, mm -hmm. uh, has a median household income of $144,000, all the way down to District 5, which is uh, $81,000. So they're, they're, they're quite different, the districts, um, in terms of the way they look. What they're similar in is the population, because our charter says that the uh, each district has to have uh, essentially the same po population. So the same number of people are in each district, but the makeup of, those, of that population is quite different from district to district, reflecting the differences in the, the neighborhoods of Montgomery County. Okay. So ballot measure C was passed in November Correct. last year Correct. in the elections. Correct. And that's Correct. what's adding two more seats. So we are going from five to seven. And so this is a particularly exciting and challenging decade to be doing this. We do this once every 10 years right. uh, because, as you said, we're going from dist five uh, uh, districts to seven districts. And so that means whereas in the past we might have looked at the current map and tweaked it, to um, adjust for population changes over the last decade. Uh, but this time we really have a much bigger job because we're, we're going from five districts to seven districts. And so that means the commission is gonna have to relook really at the whole map and figure out um, how to draw those lines. So the population is gonna be equally divided into seven districts now. So the county charter says our districts need to be equal, have equal population and they need to be contiguous. So that's by law, we have to do that, so we will do that. But, but right. within that, the, the 11 people on the commission, myself and 10 other uh, commissioners, will have to figure out how to draw equitable lines. What is the core of that challenge? The core of that challenge is there are a lot of competing interests when you start drawing lines. 
Okay, what are they? So, for instance, in Montgomery County, we look at all of our laws through a racial equity lens. Mm -hmm. And so districting should be no different. Um, and so we need to be making sure that we have enough districts that are uh, majority minority districts to give representation uh, across the county. So that's a serious concern. Uh, but it's certainly not the only concern. And so, for instance, uh, communities of interest are a big concern. If you have a, a certain community, um, it, it, it would be advantageous to have that one community within a single council district as opposed to splitting it in half. Um, the problem, of course, is that it's hard and there are lots of, of communities of interest and they're not only defined by political boundaries, Okay, they can be defined by a bunch of things in, in terms of how you think of yourself um, as, a, as a community member and as a voter. So it may be difficult to draw lines that um, uh, don't split up every possible community of interest. And then that, that consideration might butt up against trying to make, for instance, major, majority minority districts. It is a difficult and complicated question of um, how we're going to draw the lines. Um, and how the commission ends up doing this, uh, I, I, I don't know how it's going to go. Reality is the census is very, very late this year. Um, and whereas in the past, the, the census data data that we need to draw these lines mm -hmm. uh, would have been coming out in the spring. And right now, due to, well, I don't really know why, due to COVID, due to the Trump administration incompetence um, I'm, or a combination, I'm not sure. But right now they're saying we're not going to get census data until September, which means in terms of getting final numbers to draw lines, it's going to be a while. Last commission meeting, we, we talked a little bit about trying to start earlier with estimated numbers, but in the end, we're going we're gonna to need to put final numbers in. That's not going to be coming until the fall. And the, the law says that we have to have a map to the county council by November 15. Getting back to your point about equalizing in different ways the districts that you that you will draw. Usually district 1 is a big problem, right? District 1 is predominantly white, it's 75% white, while others are between 35 and 45, you know, close to 50 even. And so while the redistricting is a geographic problem, right? You have to draw a geographic line how population is distributed in the county is so varied. How do you think you, especially with the area that we know as District 1, how are you going to figure that out? That's the question the, the, the commission needs to tackle. Again, the fact that we are going from five to seven um, means that we can really look at the totality of the county um, in maybe ways that we haven't done in the past. Let's talk about your classroom experience with redistricting. I wanted to start a course at Blair where the students would be using math to solve actual problems that they are posing uh, and trying to come up with solutions, messy problems, I tell the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have this class that I teach at Blair called For Seniors, and it's for kids who have finished statistics or took one year of statistics. We never finished statistics. And it's, it's called Senior Seminar in Statistical Research. Mm -hmm. And each semester, I do a different focus. We do election predictions. We did that in the past election. And we do other projects as well. And the, a big one that I, I do often um, with them is the, this idea of redistricting because it, it, it offers everything I'm looking for in a project in math class. Okay. It offers a lot of really deep math, which we can get into if you want. Um, but it also allows them to actually do things. And so what we do in class is we work on congressional redistricting um, and the kids each take a state and they look at one or two different ways that that state could be redistricted uh, in other perhaps to draw as fair districts as possible or perhaps to uh, gerrymander districts towards uh, one party or the other. Sure. And then they go about and seeing how that in fact could be done. And then they look at they quanti they do quantitative analysis to try to um, to try to see how you can measure the impact of what you just did in drawing the maps. Okay. Um, and it's a really exciting and dynamic project where they're using a great deal of algebra and geometry, in particular, a lot of geometry, um, 
and statistics, a lot of statistics. Um, and they're trying to attack this really complicated problem of congressional redistricting. One of the things the kids learn in my, in my class when we do this project is just how easy it is to do the gerrymander, just how easy it is to stay within law and still draw districts that advantage one party over another party. We usually spend nine weeks, 10 weeks on this, something like that. So I come to the, the commission having drawn a lot of maps in my life and having seen a lot of young people draw a lot of maps. They're not drawing county council seats, they're drawing congressional seats, but the, the same ish, all the same issues come up. Are you gonna have your students work on this in parallel? I have several students who are dying to, to jump in with me. Um, and you know, it's all public data, so um, uh, I say more power to them. But again, they're gonna have to wait just like we're gonna have to wait for the, uh, for the census data to come down. What are some of the math that you actually do? One traditional um, measure of whether a district is fair is whether it's drawn compactly or not. Hmm. But how do you define compactly? We, you can have an imagine in your mind, well, if it's a circle, that's real compact. If your, your listeners want to Google search Maryland's third district or Texas 33rd district, Right. or Illinois' fourth district, you will see districts that are very, very not compact. But how do you go about quantifying that? We can see Maryland's third district, you know, is, is really snaky, but snaky right. isn't a really rigorous term. So we have these geometric measures of trying to measure the compactness. What is what? Um, so one of them, for instance, is called Polesby Popper. And it says, all right, what you do is you take the area of the district Okay, and you find a circle that has the same perimeter as the district you have, mm -hmm. imagining that as almost the perfect district. And then you take a ratio of the area of the district to the area of that circle. Ah, I got it. So if you, if you imagine a really snaky district, like Maryland's third district, and then you say, okay, well, that has a really huge perimeter because it's snaking all the way around. Right. Right. So if we drew a circle that had that same perimeter, it's going to have an area that's way, way, way bigger than that district's sure. area is. And so if we take the ratio of that, then now we have a, a, a compactness measure. I mean, there are many of these compactness measures. We study eight of them, I think, in class, eight hmm. different ways that you could go about trying to measure geometrically uh, the compactness of the district. That's what I'm saying when I'm saying that they're bringing in into class, you know, these math tools that they know, they know how to find the area of a circle, how to find the perimeter sure. of a circle, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then trying to apply that uh, to this problem is how would we measure the compactness of our district? What other kinds of problems do you come up with regularly that uh, offer these kinds of really neat uh, beautiful solutions, if you will. Well, I wouldn't agree with you that they're beautiful solutions. They're, they're really quite messy solutions, I think, right? Because, um, for instance, I told you all of those uh, compactness districts, they, uh, measures, they may give you different answers for, for, for the same district. Um, and so it can be, all of this stuff can be very difficult uh, to try to bring together. It's one of the reasons the Supreme Court has had such trouble uh, coming up with um, definitions for gerrymander. You know, another one we look at in gerrymandering with that I look on with the students is called the efficiency gap. And the efficiency gap is a is a uh, measure, a mathematical measure of wasted votes in a state. If you wanted, let's say, to advantage the Republicans in a district, would be to take as many Democrats as possible and pack them into a single district, giving the that the Democrats that district, but then enabling the Republicans to carry all the other districts. Okay, we call this packing. All right. Um, and what they're what, what that ends up doing is creating a lot of what we call wasted votes, because you could have won that district with 51 percent of the vote. But instead, you got 90 percent of the vote because they have packed in all the Democrats into that district. Okay. And so efficiency gap, which came up out about 10 years ago and was a big favorite of Justice Breyer's is a way to try to measure how many of those wasted votes that a redistricting plan comes up with. Um, and we work in class on when they draw their own maps, they have to figure out these um, uh, compactness scores and the efficiency gap scores. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the whole issue of the Voting's right, Voting Rights Act and the racial demographics of the district. Um, and so that requires another quantitative analysis uh, that the students have to do. So, so this problem is, is really, really rich uh, in, um, in math that they need to apply to the problem. I'd imagine there's another way to ensure victory, partisan victory in one district to the other, is to take, say, Democrats and sprinkle them across uh, a large number of um, Republican districts, uh, and mm -hmm. they would never have um, a majority. So, Neil, that's called cracking. So okay. there's packing and there's cracking. So packing is packing all the Democrats or, for instance, packing all the African-American voters uh -huh. into a single district. Cracking would be taking the uh, African-Americans or the uh, Democrats or, or it, it could be the other way around. Right. In Maryland, it was the other way around where we were packing um, uh, Republicans into a single district. But you also can do cracking where, like you called it sprinkling, but it's the same basic idea where you would be putting um, you know, the, the party you are trying to disadvantage uh, into a number of districts. But that's also creating um, wasted votes, right? Because they are now unable to elect a representative because they don't have enough people in their district of like mind to elect a, um, to elect a representative. And so the, that whole idea of efficiency gap is taking wasted votes and trying to figure out, are they equitably distributed between the Republican and the Democrats? Um, so, and so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting math problem. I'm going to go down this rabbit hole a little bit. So the efficiency gap of packing, can it be compared with the efficiency gap of cracking? And if you yes. do that, can you come up with some sensible way of making a choice such that you could actually make a decision based on that? I mean, I would imagine that at that point, we are back to values and we don't really, it's not math anymore and it's political science. Which the efficiency gap, which came up um, in the Supreme Court, as I said, by Justice Breyer, was the idea was by counting the um, distribution of, weighted, of wasted votes, and that could be in packing situations or cracking situations, mm -hmm. and looking to see were they predominantly Democrat or predominantly Republican. Mm -hmm. And then his idea was if it was too, if it was too uh, skewed to one side or the other, that that would be an indication of a, a, of a overly gerrymandered map. Now, this idea has been thrown out by the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme right. Court in last year ruled that they just cannot decide political, dis political gerrymandering cases. So we know now, because the Supreme Court has ruled, is that they are federal courts are not going to be making these decisions about political gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. State courts can still make those decisions, but federal courts are not going to be making those decisions anymore. They can still make decisions on Voting Rights Act violations and or racial gerrymandering, but they can't make it on political gerrymandering. That, that was the ruling of the Supreme Court. Um, but the pr that doesn't make the problem go away. Sure. Right. That just makes what the Supreme Court said the courts can rule on go away. The problem is still there. And so this idea of packing and cracking and creating wasted votes, that problem still exists, whether or not the Supreme Court wants to wants to uh, involve themselves in it. And for instance, H.R. 1, which is going through the, the Congress right now, calls for independent commissions to be make drawing these maps in all the states. Some states currently do that. In California, they do it. In Iowa, they do it. In a number of states, they do it that way. HR uh, 1 calls for all the states to do it that way. And if that were to pass, and we have independent commissions that are not the state legislatures who are drawing these maps, I think a lot of these kind of issues like wasted votes and like gerrymandering could really be part of the discussion uh, of a nonpartisan um, uh, uh, panel. All right, so nonpartisan panel, how would you describe the Montgomery County Redistricting Commission? Is, would you say that is a nonpartisan panel? We have a certain number of Democrats and a certain number of Republicans and a certain number of independents on it. It's not technically uh, independent commission because we don't decide the map. We draw the map and give it to the county council by November 15th. And then they have 30 or 60 days to either accept that map or adopt a different map. 
And they can so come up with their not, own map? They could come up with their own map um, if they wanted to. Historically, do you know if the county council has ever rejected the commission's recommendations? I don't think so, but I was when I was interviewing to be on the commission, I was looking at the history of it. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one uh, year in which a, um, a subset of the commission um, drew a second map and tried to get the um, council to adopt that second map, um, mm -hmm. but they didn't. They adopted the map that the commission had voted for. David Stein, thank you so much. What lessons can we draw from my conversations with Roy Myers and David Stein? First, the obvious. Budgeting and redistricting are incredibly fascinating. And in this budget season uh, and redistricting season, we ought to pay them more attention than we usually do. Second, state and local budgets are in much better shape. And if we make the investments we need now, those out years when the federal money dries up could very well be boosted by even more tax revenues. Political candidates across the spectrum will have to adjust their platforms to address the problems of plenty. The flip side of this is worrisome. Those that lost jobs during the pandemic were low-wage workers, and now more than ever, we need to solidify the safety net. Public health and education, which we don't think of as part of the safety net, seem to be in particular need for attention. Third, counties can move away from their flat tax rate and adopt progressive taxes. Montgomery is already at 3.5%, so introducing progressive tax structure might not be revenue neutral. Watch this space. Lastly, on the redistricting side, the delay in the census data and the possible delay in redistricting could very well and suddenly change the political dynamics in the county. Thankfully, we have David Stein and his students to help support the work of the redistricting commission. Still, the possibility of a December surprise remains. That's all for this episode. New music for this episode came from Montgomery County native and now DC singer-songwriter Emily Hall. Emily is also an international educator who trains teachers in integrating music in the classroom. You can find her work on Spotify. I'm very much looking forward to showcasing local talent and especially local music students in the podcast. If you want to share your music on the show or know someone who wants to, please email us at ihppod at gmail.com or reach out on Twitter at ihppod. I hope you will subscribe and share the podcast as we bring you stories about politics close to you and your home. See you next time.